the other thing with DRM being gone now is reporting groups. You can now be in, you can read in from multiple reporting groups and funds across as many clients as you have. How many, I think you guys have like five or six, four? Four. So you can have teams at each one reading in and it doesn't matter what group they go into because the sticks know what group they belong to. Yeah. But you'll see, you know, but when you burn the stick, it knows that, hey, this is an election day stick. So you don't have to select the group anymore. It just knows, well, this goes to election day. So as you see in the software, you will set up your reporting groups on the front end now with capture. So you'll tell it election day, absentee, whatever. When you burn that poll, it's assigned to that reporting group. So I can sit down at my four clients and just start plugging in sticks, and it doesn't matter what group because the stick knows where it goes. Um, so does that go for like the DSC 52 like for example we use them to scan both absentees and provisionals so would we then you know burn I guess you know the initial media set up for absentee and then once we switch it over to provisionals have to burn different media to load on there yes it would be two, two poles yep and which is what you're doing today no so you, are you just clearing it so how do you how do you decide for just clearing that in the we pick the group that we want to you know bring it into so you just have a separate stick though yep. yeah okay so in reality when you burn the stick you'll say this is my provisional stick and this is my early vote or pardon me my absentee stick so it knows when it when you're run uh getting ready to go to provisionals you'll save it so when that stick gets read in it goes well this is burn as provisional so these are the provisional results any other questions on the 850 yes sir it's kind of back to Jason's question in regards to saving the images. In regards to saving the images, um, if we scan a batch on Monday and that batch is then identified, you said by a report number or some kind of code number, are those code numbers programmable so we're, that we're able to program what those are when we're going to buy cities right now? No, it's just a it's it's a numeric, it's just built on each each batch, it's just if we're a batch five, next batch is gonna be six. So oh, how we go back on Wednesday and find what we did on Monday. Where is it date sensitive as well? Uh, yes, they're all time and date. They're, yeah. yeah, so what we can do is turn on uh, batch report, uh, batch reports. So as soon as you do a batch and you save it, it will automatically print out the report that you stick with that batch. So if you need to go back and look, you can pull those reports out and look at the batch number, and then you know what batch number that was. And if you don't have the report, what happens there? Uh, well, you'd have to go back and try to figure out by time and date, because they're time and date stamped as well. Anything else? We can always come back to this as well, but yeah, we just kind of thought it'd be good to kind of see a couple of the nice enhancements we think that uh, this will bring for you guys. Um, before we go into software, I do want to talk, I'm going to bring up Val, team of those guys, to talk about um, ballot on demand and ballotar specifically. I told Val, you know, you guys currently, you know, picking, right? You guys have everything pre printed basically big wall and then their early voter comes in or in-person absentee they're grabbing they're saying well, we need ballot style 12 a and they're going back picking it and handing it to the voter correct before yes we are before we get um started like into ballot is there a different system so if over at the warehouse we want to print just one or two is that different? yeah i can i can okay. absolutely go through that you bet and i was in charge of all of our great thanks um so yeah the um so the ballot our system i'll i'll, I'll move back a bit uh, Valtar system is comprised of a printer. There's a laptop and there's software um, that drives um, to allow you to be able to do printing. And it can be operated in a couple different modes. Um, it can be done in a um, batch mode to where we can either get a file from DIMS for your outbound absentees. Now I know now that you guys are currently having somebody mail them. So you wouldn't necessarily need it for that, but it can, it can bring a file in either for a batch of ballots uh, or for a single ballot if somebody walks up. Um, or you can manually type in and say, I need five of this style, 10 of this, or we can bring in a spreadsheet. So the, the, the concept of, of the ballot are is um, people use it for different things, but the most value that you're gonna see with this is if you implement it in a way where you can completely eliminate pre-ordering of those ballots. Because as soon as you need to start pre-ordering ballots, you're gonna order ballots and you're gonna have some left over. So we really try to work with customers to help them figure out how we can cover all those different needs that you've got, whether it's walk-in, you know, nursing home ballots, emergency ballots, et cetera. So you never have to pre-order 
which means you don't have to go through the crystal ball effort of figuring out how many you need. You don't have to worry about trying to stock them or maybe having them in different places and inventory them. Uh, and of course, when it's done, you don't have to uh, haul all those down to some place for 22 months to, to store. So, so that's that's kind of the ideal solution. So what I'll do is I'll start with the, with the application for the walk-ins or the in-person absentee and kind of how that would work. Talk a little bit about some of the other ways we can use it. And then um, uh, certainly you know, answer any questions or, or that you may have on it. So again, just to, to clarify on the in-person absentee. So again, you pre-order ballots, you have, I'm assuming a, a wall or cubby holes, right? That, and, and you have literally potentially thousands of different styles, correct? So somebody walks in, you go to your workstation, you check them in, um, figure out what ballot style they need, somebody goes, finds the ballot style, and again, you have multiple pages, it sounds like, so it's not just one, but they gotta pull the right number of pages. But the other thing that's kind of unique in, in Ohio is um, there's the need to have a number on the stub that matches the number in DR. So um, how are you doing that now? Are you pre-numbering those stubs and then typing that into VR? Or how are you associating the two? We just, we just record them on a cover sheet. Okay. So we don't type that into the VR system. Yeah, we're going to the VR. Okay. Um, and, and, and what you write down is the stub number on the pre-printed ballot, or what is it you're writing down? Right. Yeah, so oh. the pre-printed uh, number goes on that line. It's more for like a ballot um, accounting type surface. Okay. So There's a cover sheet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then the voter's ID is also put on there, so it links that with that person. That person to that stub number. Gotcha. All right. So instead of manually typing it in, you're writing it down. And at some point, do you take that data and put it into VR, or is it just you keep it for our title purposes? Yeah. We just could probably. And, and, and well, and, and part of the benefit of the Baltar is you can completely eliminate any of that, any of that tracking or writing. So. The way this would work with in-person voting, same process, you've got somebody comes in, you check, you check them in. There is a, um, a feature within DIMS where you'll tell it that it's a VOD ballot rather than the current process that you use in one of the menu choices. And when you do that and you hit enter, it's gonna print, um, well now you don't, you don't necessarily need to print the envelope anymore, but you know the process is the same for your users. But the difference is DIMS creates a small file that says I need a ballot for this particular person, this ballot style. Um, and in that, it also has the ABID number in it. And so that automatically gets passed over to the ballot tar. The ballot tar then is going to pick up the right ballot, all the pages for that ballot. It's going to print that ballot out, but the other thing that's nice is we're able to dynamically print information or add information to the ballot. So we'll actually add that ABID number on that stub, um, which then is associated with what's already in the system. So it basically eliminates any of that manual process, whether it's manually picking or having to do any kind of writing. So um, that's how it would work, and then of course you could you know, grab those, hand it to the voter. Um, and, and, and folks do it in different fashions. In a lot of cases, um, um, you could have these right next to the people checking in. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Are you repurposely saying ABID number as opposed to uh, voter registration number? Uh, my understanding is it's an ABID, it's a unique number for that election, Perfect. which is the key, right. exactly. Um, and um, so, so as far as implementation, um, you can have multiple check-in stations going to um, a single printer. So what folks will normally do is they'll have, um, now you can do it as a one-to-one, -one, but normally you don't need to. Normally two or three workstations, um, the printer can keep up with that. So you normally have, in, in one instance, you'll have maybe printers uh, located nearby those three workstations. They'll check people in. Um, they'll turn around, grab the ballot, hand it to the voter. That's, that's one method of doing it. Um, in real high volume situations, like we've got large early voting sites down in Florida where they you know, will have thousands of people come through a day. And in those instances, they may have eight or 10 check-in stations. And then they'll have a ballot distribution area. So they'll check somebody in, they'll walk to another area. Um, somebody will get the ballot handed to them. The nice thing here is you've got that ABID, so there's a way to make sure that you're giving the right ballot to the right person. So a couple ways to implement, but the, the key to it is it automates the process, it eliminates a lot of the work that you currently have to do now, to, both on the front end and the back end to handle ballots, and it ensures that the accuracy of the process because you're giving, giving uh, you know, the right ballot to the right person. So that's, that's the walk-in process. Is there any, any questions on that or things that you need to know about? At least three questions before I done or I fail my test. So just remember that before I get done. Um, okay. So so. The, okay. Is there a big price difference? 
So, um, so that yeah, you're right. That's the automated version now. Um, we do have uh, interfaces where we've got poll books sending that same information. So, several of the poll books out there can also send that file, and if they have the ADID number in there, we can do the same thing. But to your point, if if you have a system that is only telling us what the ballot style is and not telling us what that ADID number is, um, then you're right. We we we'd at least pull the right ballot, but you'd have some process if you need. Yeah, my experience has been in Ohio that, you know, um, poll books, which are typically used for election day, right? Not, not as much for the in-person absentee, well, is that a fair statement? It is, but we, the law just passed, so before it was not really advantageous for us to be using um, an in-house voting. Okay. So we probably will be doing that. Gotcha. Well, we could be, it's an option, yeah. so. It, and my suggestion would be is, because again, it's a relatively simple thing for the poll book vendors to do, is, and again, you know, we work, uh, I think Jed talked about how we 